Hi, uh, my name is John Sunderland. Uh, I'm a medical physicist at the University of Iowa. And I'm going to spend the next, uh, next 15, 20 minutes or so going over uh, what nuclear medicine is with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of radiation safety uh, kind of folded in towards the end. So here's a roadmap of where we're going. Um, we're going to start just with a very brief uh, uh, comparison between anatomic imaging uh, as compared to what nuclear medicine and molecular imaging is all about. Uh, then we're going to get into what nuclear medicine actually is and how it works. Uh, we're going to go uh, to what nuclear medicine is used for. We're going to do some diagnostic applications and therapeutic applications, which is a new, uh, new and upcoming uh, er and exciting area, and then follow with some radiation safety considerations just at the very end. So to start off just for context here, um, what you see on the left-hand side of the screen are four very common anatomic imaging techniques that you're familiar with. So for example, MRI in the upper left really is uh, an image of the hydrogen density in your body. Uh, if you go to angiography right next to that, you inject just a little bit of, uh, of uh, radioactive opaque uh, liquid into the veins and you can get exquisite, very high resolution uh, uh, images of the vascular vas vascular churn, the heart and, and other places by passing x-rays through it. If you look at CT down in the lower left, that's taking x-rays that are go going through the body at about a thousand different angles. We can put those together to create highly detailed anatomical uh, images, which you see there. Uh, ultrasound uses ultrasound waves that reflect back, uh, give you real-time images, for example, of, 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 of fetuses and babies. But all of this stuff looks at anatomy in the human body. Uh, whereas what we have in the area of molecular imaging is we're actually looking at function, we're looking at biochemistry. What you see on the left hand side uh, is an image of glucose metabolism. So we're not looking at structure here so much as we are, ooh, look at the brain. The brain has a lot of activity. The heart has a lot of activity. If you look uh, more importantly in the chest, you can see the tumor where you have cells that are dividing rapidly, they're metabolizing glucose rapidly, so we can see very clearly what that is and distinguish what might be a cyst or, or, or some other lump from actual active tumor. If you look in the upper right, we have a brain scan, which is distinguishing uh, a normal, normal brain. We're looking at dopamine storage here on the left, Parkinson's disease on the right. Anatomically, these two structures look the same on an MRI or a CT, uh, but here we can see very clearly that the function is compromised. And if you look down below that, we're looking at perfusion uh, of the heart, what parts of the heart are actually getting blood. We're looking at function here. So on the left-hand side, anatomy, right side, function, which is our, our nuclear medicine molecular imaging biz. So we're going to go from there and get into what is nuclear medicine and how does it work. So in all cases, when we do a nuclear medicine study, we are administering a tiny, tiny quantity of drug uh, that has a radioactive atom attached so we can trace its path through the body. So what you see here on the left is a molecule, it's a glucose molecule again, that happens to have a fluorine 18, a radioactive atom attached. This is like my kids, they carry around cell phones and I can track where they go all over town because the, the cell phone is, is transmitting radio waves and, and the like, such that I can see, see where they are. Similarly, when we get radioactive decay, we can place where that molecule is in the body. So we are tracing where the glucose goes in the body over time. Now, what we're doing is we're injecting a tiny quantity. And when I say tiny, I mean tiny. When we do one of these studies with this radioactive glucose, we're injecting about a millionth of a single grain of radioactive sugar. So the mass quantity is small. There's almost no possibility for side effects or anything like that. This is a tracer methodology. And then we use special scanners uh, to detect the gamma rays from the nucleus of the radioactive atom. Now we're not doing magic here uh, and we're not doing anything unnatural. We're using what mother nature gave to us. You're probably all familiar with the periodic table you'll see here and all familiar with, uh, with carbon. Um, which we see here, there's two stable isotopes of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-13. But if we put one extra neutron into that nucleus, we end up with carbon-14, which is radioactive. It's unstable. It decays with a half-life of about 5,000 years, and this is what we use for carbon dating. If we take a neutron away, uh, then we end up with carbon-11. We now have too few neutrons and too many protons. It's unstable. This has a half-life of 20 minutes, very unstable. Um, but we can use this and image it with positron emission tomography 
And in fact, what you see in the lower right here is an image of C11 choline, which allows us to, uh, to detect prostate cancer quite sensitively. You can see in the, in the kind of in the, in the groin area, a little tiny dot, which is where a hidden prostate cancer is metastasized. So this is just to give you a little bit of a, of a harbinger of where, uh, where you're going to be going in this invention, not just this, but other, uh, other talks that are coming. Uh, we're gonna look at radiopharmaceuticals because in nuclear medicine, we only see what our molecules are targeting. And so what we have on the left is F18 fluoroestradiol, FES, which is very specific for not, not only breast cancer, but estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, which will help a physician guide a particular kind of therapy that will be effective to patients who have this particular kind of breast cancer. In the middle, we have F18 DCFPYL. This is a PSMA prostate cancer imaging agent, recently approved just as FES was on the, pre, on the just to the left. This was just recently approved, a highly, highly sensitive way to detect the spread of prostate cancer. Uh, this is gonna be a game changer in the way, uh, way prostate cancer is managed. This too was just recently approved and is, is hitting the market. And on the right is copper, copper 64 dotatate. We've had dotatates approved before, but not with copper 64. Copper 64 is different because instead of a half-life of an hour or two, it has a half-life of two, uh, 12 hours, which means they can make it centrally in St. Louis and they can ship it by FedEx anywhere in the country, even up as far as Alaska. It'll be there the next day. And so now everybody has access to this, which is used for somatostatin receptor imaging and neuroendocrine tumors. Once again, highly specific to cancers and to, to molecules. Going to go very briefly over the three kinds of radioactive decay. There's negative beta decay when there are too many neutrons. There's positron decay when there's too many protons, and there's alpha decay, which we're not going to discuss today. There's really only three of them. The particles that they emit, they only, just an electron or a positron, they really only go a millimeter or so. We don't worry about those so much, uh, but we almost in all cases get a gamma ray at the same time. And gamma rays are very penetrating. They go way more than a millimeter, and they can actually make it outside of the body where we detect them with our scanners. And if they're positron emitters, because they have too many protons, not enough neutrons, we use a PET scanner. If they detect, if they uh, decay by beta decay, we use we use a SPECT scanner, which is below. PET is usually a little bit higher resolution and a little bit higher sensitivity, but they're both highly useful and both uh, great imaging. Mm -hmm. So this is how it works. We generally inject in the arm, although in this center video you can actually see it being injected in the in the foot, and you could actually see how. And this is what happens when we inject one of these radioactive. Uh, radio pharmaceuticals into the body. It goes into the vein, it goes to the heart, it goes to the lung, it spreads to the different organs, uh, to whatever physiology that that molecule is supposed to go to. So this is going to start again in a minute, and we'll look at it again. But then on the right, we image. The imaging takes on the order of 15 minutes on a PET scan, 30 minutes on a SPECT. So once again, if you see this going up, you see it going into the, into the lungs, into the heart, going into the rest of the blood, so it can be delivered. Uh, here we're just we're only one minute out right now, and pretty soon you're going to see it start go, starting to go into the kidneys. The kidneys are getting it; it's filtering it out. The bladder just filled up; it's going to the heart. You can see the brain is using the glucose. You can see the heart is using the glucose. Uh, but if it were a different agent, the distribution would be different, and, and that's what we do. So, going to launch from here into what nuclear medicine is used for. So, I'm going to go through some diagnostic applications current and, uh, and, and upcoming, and then some therapeutic applications, which are, uh, which are also uh, actually quite exciting and, and game changing. This is just a brief slide with some bread and butter stuff that the uh, imaging, nuclear medicine imaging things that we've been doing for, for decades, frankly. Uh, we've been doing the cancer imaging with FDG and PET. Uh, we look for cardiovascular disease using SPECT imaging or PET imaging. Um, I'm showing this pulmonary embolism imaging because on the left-hand side, uh, this is one we don't inject. This is a radioactive gas that we inhale. We use that in combination with an injectant uh, dose to see A, where air is getting, and B, where blood is getting, and we use that together. On the right-hand side, uh, we're looking at, once again, the movement disorders, but we can look at amyloid imaging uh, with Alzheimer's disease, uh, et cetera. Um, these are all exciting, but old. What I'm gonna briefly go over now are things you're gonna learn about in a little bit more detail in, in subsequent talks. But I just wanna introduce you, first of all, to this F18 FES, which I mentioned before. This is fluoroestradiol. This was just recently approved within about the last year or so. 
It's used in the detection of estrogen receptor positive lesions as an adjunct to biopsy in patients with recurrent metastatic breast cancer. This helps guide the physician to the appropriate treatment for this particular patient. Uh, it is uh, approved by FDA and it is also being reimbursed. Here we're talking, we're gonna go through, the next two are both PSMA prostate cancer imaging agents. This first one is gallium 68 PSMA. Uh, this is uh, approved, although it's only commercially available through the University of California, San Francisco and UCLA at this point in time. They're the ones who submitted the application to the FDA. So those are the people that are approved. Although there are academic institutions, the University of Iowa is one of them, who continue to perform these studies under uh, an FDA approved mechanism, an IND, on a temporary basis until we get access to these commercial agents because FDA wants people to have access uh, to drugs that are, that are safe and effective. Uh, this is approved. Uh, and it is reimbursed by CMS and generally by private insurers, but you generally, uh, as in all of these agents, you pretty much need pre-approval. Uh, this is a similar PSMA agent for prostate cancer. This one is labeled with F18. F18 has a half-life of two hours as compared with gallium 68 with one. This one is much more easily transported uh, from central production. Um, this is, uh, and, and it's not a university that submitted this, it's the company. Uh, this is newly approved just within the last few months. Um, it's available now in some major pet metropolitan areas and the availability is rapidly expanding. As I said, this is going to be a game changer for prostate cancer management. And here, as I mentioned, is the copper 64 dotatate. Gallium 68 dotatate has been approved. This does functionally exactly the same thing. The point here is this is available nationwide. They can get it to any hospital uh, that's licensed, uh, that's actually licensed to have it uh, in, in the country. And that's, uh, that's exciting and a big boon to the neuroendocrine tumor uh, community. And the last one I'm gonna point out, these are three brain imaging agents, Alzheimer's uh, disease uh, agents that, that image amyloid. These have been approved, frankly, for almost a decade but they haven't been used because Medicare CMS does not reimburse for them. They don't reimburse, not because they don't work, but because there was no therapeutic out there for Alzheimer's disease. Now with the tentative approval of, of, a, of, a, of a drug Agihelm uh, that you've probably heard about in the newspaper, it is possible that these are going to uh, be seeing widespread use to make sure a patient actually does have Alzheimer's disease before they have access to that very, uh, very expensive therapeutic drug. And there are other good therapeutic drugs that are in the pipeline right now that are doing functionally, uh, functionally the same thing. So uh, this is another area of nuclear medicine imaging where it might manifest itself in order to, uh, uh, to help with management of patients in a very common uh, and devastating disease. I wanna just spend a minute on therapeutic applications here. Um, so we don't just diagnose with nuclear medicine, we can actually do therapy. Now, fundamentally, we know that very large doses of radiation can kill cells or at the very least damage the DNA so it can't divide anymore. Uh, this is the foundation of external beam radiation therapy that's been a, a staple of cancer therapeutics for, for more than 50 years now. But it kind of makes you think. Because here on the left-hand side is a gallium-68 uh, dotatate scan. So this is a patient with widely metastatic disease um, in, in the body. You, there's no way that you can do surgery on a patient like this or, or anything. What you really like to do is to target just the tumors, which is exactly what this gallium-68 is doing. It's going straight to the tumors and almost nowhere else. So it makes you think, what if instead of injecting a tiny bit of gallium-68 dotatate, you injected a lot of lutetium-177 dotatate, same molecule, same targeting, but lutetium-177 has a half-life of about a week. So what happens here is the radiation goes to the tumors, it sits in the tumors for a week or two and blasts the, the, the tumors, the, the, uh, the neuroendocrine tumors that they're bound to with radiation to the point where hopefully you give the tumors a lethal dose and what you end up with is a patient who, in this case, is virtually disease-free. Um, this is almost like magic. Not all patients respond like this, of course, but this is a very effective way to treat metastatic disease. Neuroendocrine tumors are an orphan indication, which means there are not a whole lot of those. Prostate cancer uh, is, a, is a much more common 
uh, a common disease. Um, just to just to, to follow up, lutetium-177 dotatate was approved in 2018, and it is being used all over the country now for the therapy of neuroendocrine tumors. But moving on to PSMA um, for prostate cancer, once again, we have this imaging agent that goes very specifically to the tumors. So the question is, ooh, what happens if we label it with a long-lived radionuclide, lutetium-177, with that half-life of, of almost a week, and we inject a lot of it? So here are six cases, A, B, C, D, E, and F. In the first image, you see in red where the, the gallium the imaging agent shows where the tumor was. And then in B, you can see after therapy uh, what the response was. So once again, the first three, you see the disease almost completely eradicated. Uh, in D, E, and F, you see partial response, but certainly dramatic, uh, dramatic response. And so this is all, uh, all exciting. Um, this is not approved yet. Uh, but the phase three trial, the one that they're going to use to try and get it approved, has functionally completed. They've done their preliminary analysis, and they have met their statistical endpoints of prolonged overall survival of patients who receive this treatment. So they will be applying to FDA, and I wouldn't be surprised if in a year or so that this will be available uh, to, to the general population, which is, uh, which is a huge step forward. Uh, lastly, just spending a couple minutes on radiation safety considerations, uh, just with regard to nuclear medicine. Um, I just want to let you know we're all being exposed to background radiation even as we speak. Cosmic rays from space are coming down. We have radioactivity in Earth. We have radioactivity inside our bodies, and as well as the radon that, uh, that's in our basement. Um, we know about how much radiation we get. We get about one millirem per day. Uh, just from background radiation. So if we bear that in mind, we get one per day just in general. I want to put that into context. So one per day is background, not harmful. Uh, if we go up to 500,000 of those units of radiation dose, your whole body at once, that can cause acute harm and even death. So uh, that's, that's on the high side. If we go down a factor of 10 to 50,000 millirem, bearing in mind we get one per day, and we get that all at once, then we believe we can see a very, very slight increase in the downstream risk of cancer. It's not a sure thing. In fact, it's, it's only barely blip above the, the normal cancer incidence rate. Um, uh, but that's about our level of detectability. Maybe we might be able to go down to 40,000 and, and detect a little bit of, of an increase there, which is why we go down a factor of 10 still to go 5,000 millirem per year, which is what we believe is safe for radiation safety workers at hospitals in nuclear power plants and stuff to be exposed to. So the technologists that are doing your scans, they're radiation workers, and uh, at least at the pet center here, our uh, technologists get on the order of 1,000, 1,500 millirem per year, which by the way is on the high end of what patients get for a, uh, for a single nuclear medicine procedure. We conservatively assume that even though we can't detect an increased rate of cancer at these low, low rates, we conservatively assume that maybe they can. So, so we, we, we just assume that less radiation to the patient uh, is always preferable as long as we get the right information out. Okay? This is just putting this all into context. Uh, for a chest x-ray, you get about 10 millirem. That's about 10 days of background radiation. And for a nuclear medicine thyroid scan, you get approximately the same thing. On the other end of the spectrum, for a FDG, uh, that's a, one of those glucose PET scans, along with a CT study at the same time, you'll get between 1,000 and, and 2,000 millirem or so, which, as I, as I mentioned before, that's about what our technologists get over the course, over the course of the year, still well within our, within our safety margins. So that's the kind of range that we're talking about for, uh, for clinical scans. How much radiation would be considered too much in the grand scheme of things? Well, in our biz, the answer is more than is necessary. We don't want to give more than that. In all cases, these are prescribed drugs when we inject these radioactive uh, radiopharmaceuticals into you. And the benefit of the imaging study far outweighs any potential risk. Each of the imaging procedures takes a certain amount of radiation to perform appropriately. This is well studied. We know what that is. Using too much radiation dose, it leads to unnecessarily radiation dose to the patient. But using too little may not provide enough information, which may be harmful in and of itself. If we're too worried about radiation, we don't give you enough, 
and our images are cruddy and we don't detect the cancer that we're trying to see, then we're actually doing harm by not giving, uh, giving you enough radiation dose. So each imaging procedure is optimized for the medical question, the equipment being used, and the patient. And this is what is practiced universally in the United States. Uh, the SNMMI uh, has initiated two dose optimization campaigns, the Image Gently and the Image Wisely campaign, uh, one's for children, one's for adults. And both of these promote the appropriate procedure for that specific patient with the minimum amount of radiation dose necessary to provide the useful information that we're trying to get. Uh, the SNMI has a web page on these topics. It's snmmi.org slash dose if you are interested in such things. Um, and with that, I think I will conclude and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the program uh, and the rest of your day. Thank you.